Hello, my name is Stacey Oshima. Um, I'm an assistant director at the Division of Career Pathways. Very excited to have our amazing panel of allied health therapist careers. Um, I would love to just introduce each of our panelists and then we'll go right into asking questions. So we have Lori Hollett, who is the audiologist and the owner of Hearing Services West. We also have Kristen Kobayashi, who is a speech language pathologist at the Anaheim Elementary School District. And Kristen's also a UCI alum. We have Hannah Schmidt, who is an occupational therapist with Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center. And we have Jeremy Yuen, who is a physical therapist at Kaiser Permanente. And Jeremy is also a UCI alum. So welcome everyone. So happy to have you joining us. And I think we'll just kick it off with Lori. If you wouldn't mind sharing what's your current position and what do you do in your job? Um, so I've been an audiologist for 25 years. Many of those years I worked for other people. The past 11 years I'm in ownership. So it, that in that aspect, I wear a lot of different hats. Business, which I've never had a business class. So, you know, that's certainly a learning curve there. But, um, you know, I fit hearing aids. I do oral rehab with patients. Um, diagnostics. I have ENTs who come into the office. So um, I, I do heavy diagnostics. Um, it, it's very multifaceted. We can get people with ringing in their ears, people with um, balance issues. So I guess I like audiology because it's, it's diverse. You're not doing the same thing. It, there's, there's a lot to do. Makes it interesting. Thank you so much, Lori. Kristen, how about you? There we go. Um, hi, so I am a speech language pathologist in elementary school. And so mostly we work on evaluating students um, who may have a speech or language uh, disorder. We evaluate them, give them tests, talk to their teachers, their family, um, anything like that. And then we have um, kind of our IEP uh, team. Um, uh, which are different members at the school site. And then um, we also do treatment. So that's, um, you know, group sessions, individual sessions. Um, and it's actually fascinating because there's so many different kind of speech and language um, disorders. Just to just name a few categories, um, I think most people know articulation. So if people have lisps, we're working on uh, figuring out correct tongue placement and movement and all that good stuff. So our articulators are moving correctly, but we're also working on language disorders. So how they're understanding language, how they're um, outputting language, their grammar, um, everything like that. We also work on stuttering, um, if they stutter or they clutter. Um, we also work on pragmatics, so that's um, our social skills as well. So there's a bunch of different um, facets of that, um, but those are kind of the two things, eval and treatment for that, and uh, working as a team. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. Um, how about you, Hannah? Um, what, do you, what is your current position and what do you do in your role? So I currently work in inpatient as an occupational therapist. I am a float, so I work on many different units. I specialize in neuro, so I'm typically on either the stroke unit or the brain injury unit, um, and that's with adults, but I also float over to spinal cord and to pediatrics, and I'm per diem at another hospital as well, in which I work in the ICU, the step-down unit, which is the DOU, and med surge. So I help patients with their everyday activities, their ADLs, helping them get dressed and kind of getting back to their hobbies, seeing what interests them, such as cooking, or they like to ride bikes and really just getting them back to the life that they want to have, trying to get them independent as possible before they go back home. Thank you. And how about you, Jeremy? Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a physical therapist for, um, actually, it's a Kaiser Permanente, Washington. I'm based in Seattle. Um, so not to be confused with any of the Kaisers down there, um, not that big of a difference, but uh, I work in our occupational health department, which is um, pretty much orthopedics, orthopedic based focus, but mostly my demographic is focusing with people who were injured on while well, working and then focusing on getting them back to work, or if they can't get back to work, um, then trying to maximize their medical improvement and then figuring out what's the next best option to 
pursue career wise or find a job that can work within their um their new set of limitations i think we all have such a, a diverse um or, or different understandings about each of these different careers so it's really interesting to see i think the breadth of the individuals that you work with and you know the different stages of of life <laughs> excuse me um and issues that they've um, struggled with. So thank you all. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about sort of the career path, like what career path led you to your current position? And if we could start with Kristen, that would be great. Sure, so my career path, um, so I went to UCI for my undergrad. Um, I studied um, psychology and social behavior. Um, and then I was a minor in educational studies. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something typically with, with children, something to do with education. I thought maybe I could be a child psychologist. My uncle is a, a psych professor. And so I was like, hmm, maybe, maybe I'll go into that. But I think after I was um, observing, I shadowed a lot, um, I got to get kind of firsthand experience um, in the schools, or in a private practice for speech. I was like, oh, I, I really, really enjoy this. Um, I really liked how it was um, not just being creative and coming up with uh, therapy lessons and trying to increase their motivation, but it's also like you're taking data, you're taking, you know, um, quantitative data on how they are improving on their goals. Um, and so kind of that shared perspective, I really, really enjoyed. I did. Um, so UCI, I don't think they, they have it either right now, but um, I needed to, to go to a post-baccalaureate program um, to take classes um, in order to um, even apply to graduate school. Um, so I did that at Cal State Fullerton. That was about um, two years of post-bac. And then I did um, grad school after that also at Cal State Fullerton. So it's kind of a journey a little bit longer maybe than if people um, you know, start right away from undergrad um, in communication um, sciences and disorders, which is the undergrad that you would um, be in if you want to be an SOP right from the get-go. Um, but that's that was kind of my journey. Thank you for sharing that. And actually, because I think all of the careers represented in the panel today, they all have that in common where you're you're not going to come out as an undergrad and just walk straight into that field. Um, I think that that is a pretty uh, good question that I think a lot of our students will have. And, and we can either touch on it now as you're answering this question. But I think as you think about, um, you know, what can UCI students do? Because we don't have like a, a pre-speech there, a, a speech language pathology or a pre-PT, or, you know, we don't have these um, programs that just sort of naturally fit into, you can slide into that grad program. Um, certainly sharing a little bit about how you got there. And then maybe we can talk at a, in a later question about what are other things that UCI students could do to help themselves be able to be, marketable for grad school, that would be great. So Hannah, would you like to share a little bit about your particular career path? So mine was a bit untraditional. I was a global studies and Spanish major in undergrad at Sonoma State. Um, so after graduating, I wanted to go into policy and kind of just changed paths. I went into insurance for about five or six years. I was volunteering at an orphanage down in Nicaragua and it was for kids with disabilities. And I said, I don't know what this is, but whatever, I can do to be involved in this way. I want to do it. And I just happened to bump into a friend that was a pediatric OT. Um, so I started my prereqs from there. I started at 27, took me about a year to do all the prereqs. I was at UCLA Extension, UC San Diego online, UC Berkeley, um, and my community college to try to get as many classes as I could within a year. And then I got into Washington University out in Missouri, the School of Medicine in St. Louis. And that's where I started my grad program. From there, did you, um, coming out of your grad program, start at, at Rancho Los Amigos? Yeah, so I actually was lucky enough to come back to California to do my field work. So I did a three-month clinical at Rancho. And then once I graduated, took my boards, all of that, was able to start back and work full-time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. How about you, Jeremy? What about your career path? Yeah, so it's kind of similar to what um, everyone else kind of said. So I did my undergrad degree at um, UC Irvine. Um, I was actually a public health major. Um, so so in public health for what I wanted to do, like I was always kind of hovering between like somewhere in the medical field 
but I couldn't figure out where. And then um, I actually did an internship with UC Irvine. It's um, the UCI Sports Medicine Program. I don't know if they still have it there, but um, did an internship with them. And then it would, we follow the physical therapists and it's more physical therapy, athletic training based. But it's like, oh, it kind of clued me into like wanting to do physical therapy. And then on top of that, um, so from there, I kind of got some pointers to go where to go to PT school, how to get into it. Luckily for me, my public health degree killed a lot of my prereqs, but there is like a couple of courses I think that I'm a little removed from UC Irvine. So <laughs> I don't know if they offered it, but um, one of the things that I noticed that UC Irvine didn't have, so if anyone is interested for PT, um, and I think maybe OT as well, is to look at um, anatomy and physiology. Because I, took, I finished up, I took a year gap between undergrad and grad school where I just finished up all my prereqs, but it was like, I only needed like two classes for that. Then after that, I uh, applied to grad school, went to school in New Hampshire, actually. Um, pretty cold out there. Don't really recommend it. <laughs> um, and then I got my job back in Washington, Seattle area, um, bounced between a couple of orthopedic jobs, eventually landed in um, at Kaiser, and I'm doing the occupational health program, and I'm developing the um, occupational health physical therapy department there so there you go that's that's awesome and actually pretty pretty great that you only had a few extra classes that you needed to take after UCI um, to be able to get into your DPT program I only needed if I remember correctly anatomy because UC Irvine offered anatomy, but no lab component, which is like mm -hmm. the cadaver or like just any lab component of anatomy. And then the other one was um, physiology. Mm -hmm. um, and then some physical therapy schools are weird about like what def defines a year's worth of anatomy and physiology or a quarter's worth of any. So it was easier to do it at a community college to just knock it all out. Well, that's that's great. And the fact that you were able to, to do it at a community college and kind of quickly move on into your grad program. How about yeah. you, Laurie? Oh, sorry. Mine's a, a little different. Um, when I was young, my mom is of a Mexican heritage and descent. She didn't speak English when she went to kindergarten. Um, and so there wasn't there wasn't a lot of encouragement for me as a female to go on and, and do anything other than become a mom, which is beautiful and I am a mom. But so there wasn't a lot of encouragement. Um, in fact, I was told that I couldn't go to college. So it was a very tough journey. So I think in telling this, I wanna encourage anybody male and especially female, if you have a dream, follow it. My dream was to work somewhat in the medical field to help people, um, to make those connections. And I was able to do that. It was very hard. I got my bachelor's degree from Cal State Fullerton. Big shout out to Dr. Michael Davis, who was the audiologist on staff there, who encouraged me and encouraged me. And it took many years. I had kids and in between my bachelor's and master's, it went back, small children. It, it was a tough journey, but, you know, um, I always knew what I wanted and where I wanted to go. And I did get there. You were blazing a trail and I appreciate you there the resilience it takes to to do that. I mean, we have our our environments that we grow up in, and that does influence us greatly and speak to a lot of those the things that we're exposed to and the things that we're either encouraged or discouraged from pursuing. So thank you, Lori, for um, just sharing your your inspiration and just even your encouragement with our students because I think we could all use that reminder. Okay, so I've got a question about skills. Um, what's one of the most important, there's a lot of skills involved, obviously, in all of these uh, different careers, but is there kind of one particular skill that you feel like is, is the most important? And how did you start developing this skill when you were in school? Um, and it could be when you were at UCI or certainly after. Um, after. So um, Hannah, can we start with you? 
I think your interpersonal skills in OT is the most important is that you really want to get to know your client or patient and see what motivates them, what's important to them, what they want to get back to doing, but also meeting them where they're at. So if somebody's having a really off day, really bad day, you don't want to just keep pushing them. You want to see, like, try to understand where they're coming from. And I think that for me was, it was interesting being in the Midwest for school compared to growing up in LA and just kind of learning how to navigate different people. And I've lived in other countries. And I think that's just something that really helped um, my experience. And especially being in OT is that not everybody's the same. So you can't expect to walk into a room and have the same response every time. I think what's cool is that I've been able to use my Spanish a lot at Rancho. And that's not something that sometimes it gets kind of a barrier when you have to go through somebody else and that you're able to connect with them. So I think that's a really cool skill that I've been able to hone and use. But I think it's really just that personality of just like, okay, how much can I help this person without pushing them past their boundaries? Thank you. Um, how about you, Jeremy? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of double down on that interpersonal skill, just being able to not only like relate, but like you have to kind of understand how people think and know how they think. And then it becomes this, at least in my field, I deal with a lot of people who are coming from work injuries. So a big um, component of it is pain management. And so a lot of it is learning how someone is. And then once you learn how they are, it's like then learning how to anticipate things that will trigger pain or trigger any painful response to anything. It, it could be the things you say, do, exercises, yada, yada, yada. Um, so just learning how to learn to read people is a really good skill set to have. Um, and then also on top of that, it's just a lot of being flexible and critical thinking because what you see one day, they may come back and it's completely flipped on the other side. So just learning how to manage like, oh, what worked well one day did not work well this day and just trying to, okay, we'll try to figure that out a lot faster. I imagine that it's helpful for, I think, all of you um, having the opportunity to see repeat patients, right? So it's not usually just a one-time uh, visit and, and that's it. But even though you might have that consistency with your, your caseload, not everybody comes in feeling exactly the same way, right? We all have those good days and bad days. And particularly if there's been some injury that's um, caused them to come and see you, you're seeing people under various... Um, stages of stress as well. So I think, was it Kristen or had shared that you were a psych major even? So I think, uh, you know, reading people and, and all of those themes that everyone is sharing is hugely important. You're not just um, a technical expertise in your field, but you do have to kind of be a little bit of a mind reader at times and know how to adjust and flex with that. Thank you. How about you, Lori? Once again, I'm going to agree with Hannah and Jeremy on interpersonal skills. It's just really important for me. My main population are seniors. You've got to just slow down with each one and you have to build a trust uh, that you're there to truly help them. And so it's very important for school. Audiology has a lot of math that, you know, you were talking about you know, sound waves and it's like studying electricity um, too. It's, it's very math, mathematically heavy, um, the degree. But once you get out, the interpersonal skills, you know, be, it's, and it's kind of a science and an art audiology because you've got, you've got to know and understand the brain, how it functions, but then you also have the art of working with people in um, with the hearing aids, when you're fitting hearing aids, you have to listen to the person and what they tell you is wrong. It might not be the, the book answer on how you manipulate that hearing aid. So you have to listen to the person and the words they use. So those interpersonal skills are huge. Definitely common themes throughout. How about you, Kristen? Similar or other, other skills? 
Yeah, definitely um, similar. Let's see, I would also, so um, piggybacking off of the being flexible part, um, I think we all have to be very flexible. Um, I think that's one of the skills that I have to utilize pretty much every second of the day, whether that's being flexible with um, kind of other staff members, making sure we're working closely um, as a team um, to really, really get to, you know, what um, are these children's like difficulties um, in the school? Um, why um, aren't they communicating or, you know, um, building a treatment plan like that? Um, and then obviously you get to the, the sessions. And um, so I work with, um, all the way from TK to sixth grade. So a huge range um, of how they're behaving, their uh, motivation levels, um, everything like that. And so it's kind of paired with flexibility and also like good rapport building. Um, kids are not going to do what you say or um, anything like that if they don't really trust you or feel like they're in a safe um, environment and space. And so really making it clear that, you know, they know that you're there for them, that, you know, sometimes speech therapy, sure, we have our plan, we have our lesson plans, we have, you know, all of our resources, um, but sometimes kids aren't feeling it, especially kids with um, all kinds of disorders. Um, they may be screaming, you know, and we, we have to figure out why. Um, so it's kind of like pairing, um, you know, having strong lessons and making sure we're um, targeting all their goals, um, coupled with, you know, behavior management, um, figuring out where they are, um, that specific moment. And again, meeting them there, like Hannah mentioned. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of that. Cause sometimes, yeah, they, they want to just, you know, cry on the floor or they want to throw things at you or give you attitude or there's all these different scenarios. So it's trying to be flexible around that. And how do I, um, you know, convey that I'm there for them, but also teach them and create these um, expectations for them. You all wear many hats as you go about your your work days and and work with your um, with your clients. Um, so if if you could speak to what can students do um, to be sort of ready for a position in in your respective areas. So I, I know obviously a, a, a big part and we touched a little bit was like the just making sure you've taken the prereqs um, and and the classes to be able to get into uh, your various grad programs. But if you think maybe more about other um, other things, other um, how can they develop some of the skills that maybe the, the grad admissions officers are looking for when admitting, or you know how can um, how can they demonstrate some of that experience or exposure to those areas? Are there certain things that you might recommend for students to do um, to really help position them um, a little bit more competitively and just grow in knowledge of the field. Um, so maybe if we could start with Jeremy, that would be great. Yeah, so it's hard to kind of sugarcoat this, but um, at least in my field and with what I've looked at for helping people, I, I've kind of consulted a lot of people who applied to PT school in the past and helped them try to like get into programs and everything and actually pretty successful, but, um, but hard to sugarcoat it, but um, it's a little bit hard to say this, but GPAs and grades do matter in a certain degree manner. Um, and it's, so what I always kind of encourage people to do is, so when you're in college, like do take the courses that you need to take for the program, but also, you know, try to find a major that something you're good at or a major take courses that you're good at and things that you can excel at um, because that will help with just the application process and then on the second part in terms of at least my field what really helps a little bit more is um experience um get it just finding an internship anywhere um there's plenty of places that have opportunities to like let you go in as an aide and you can get hands-on day-to-day benefits um for me, a huge chunk, I saw on someone in the chat that the sports medicine program still exists. That I think probably helped me quite a bit because I got a lot of hands-on experience in that. And also that helped with if schools are still doing interview process. You can pull a lot of like experiences and short uh, stories with that internship. Um, so internships are really good. Um, and then in tar top of that, it's just try to get like a variety of internships. Um, so physical therapy is kind of fun because, and Hannah kind of mentioned it a little bit. We got a pretty broad 
demographic that we can cover. We can go as far as like ICU, acute care, you know, people clinging on to life type patient demographic. And then we get some college level athlete or professional, professional sports level athletes who recover from like a sprained ankle. Um, so our spectrum is quite large. And so if you get like a variety of experiences in different settings, um, a lot of colleges will kind of, they won't like put too much emphasis, but they'll take notes and see that you have that variety of experience. And it does, well, it usually comes up in conversations. So. That, that's good to note. Um, you know, again, just even as college students, you don't have to wait until you graduate to start gaining that experience. Um, you know, UCI does have a pretty amazing sports um, medicine internship program. And so I'm glad to hear that you are um, a successful product of that, uh, that program, Jeremy. Actually, from my cohort, I'm one of four, as far as I'm aware. Really? <laughs> All four of us are PTs now. Yeah. It's awesome. And I, speaking as a mom, um, so my kids are all, they're all teenagers now, but UCI has a number of like youth sports camps. And so for years in the summer, I would put my kids in those youth sports camps and um, I became very familiar with the undergrad sports medicine interns through those. And they have, they were, they were amazing. And I do know a number of them who went off um, and became physical therapists. So um, I, I affirm that it's a great program to look into. So students who are interested in that, just Google UCI Sports Med Intern and you should find uh, contact information on the website as well. Lori, how about you? What can students do to kind of help themselves be ready for a career in audiology? Well, I, I'm gonna agree with Jeremy there. I mean, when I went, it was a master level education and it's turned to doctoral. So it's, it, that makes it competitive because you've got, you know, you've got to go to UC. They have open programs at the state level where, you know, some of the UCs are supporting the um, Cal State LA, Cal State Northridge have programs. So, but there aren't as many programs as there used to be. So unfortunately you have to have those top grades to get into the programs. Um, but also, once again, um, trying to get some volunteer or just some ob observing. Um, I never say no to students because I had a lot of no's in my day. So I, I see a lot of students um, come through and get hours just to learn if they could see walking in my shoes, you know, and, and what actually happens because what you learn in school obviously is valuable, but it doesn't always translate exactly to, you know, boots on the ground. So, so it is good to get into an office, even if you just, you know, four hours, you know, you learn a lot in those four hours. Lori, are there, um, cause you know, I hear about like PT aid or like OT aid and, and, you know, are there like, those types of positions and levels at the audiology level or in the audi audiology field? Yes, there are audiology assistants, there are audiometrists, and there are hearing aid dispensers. So, you know, we're a very young field. So I don't think we've even quite figured out what we're doing and where we're exactly headed, to, in my opinion. But, um, to be an audiology assistant, there are, um, you can be trained by an audiologist to be hearing aid dispenser. Um, you have to have a high school diploma and you have to pass an exam and, and it's, it's a difficult exam. You can't just really just study for it. You've got to have some practical experience as well. And then um, to be an audiometrist, you do need a bachelor's degree. And the audiometrists are used by school districts because, um, I mean, Kristen can vouch for all of this, Get kindergarten, second grade, fifth grade, and 12th graders, I believe, are screened through the school system. Through the school system. So there are people who just go in and pull kids out of the classroom and um, screen their hearing and they catch a lot they catch a lot so it's it's that's an important job thank you thank you for sharing about that that's a whole mm -hmm. 
world that I didn't know existed that I think is helpful yeah. for students as they're exploring and they have an interest mm -hmm. or maybe wanting to get some experience before diving into um, a doctoral program. So thank you. How about you, Kristen? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, okay, so definitely grades that that is actually really important, uh, especially um, in our field. And there's so many competitive programs, especially in California. So that's kind of number one way I've heard, like sometimes they, they kind of don't really look at your application if it's under a certain uh, GPA number. So it kind of hurts, but that's kind of the reality of it. That's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing, you know, like everyone was saying, is the experience. Um, for SLPs, there's so many different settings that we can be in, right? I'm in a school, but you can also be in a hospital, right? You can also be in a private practice. You could be a teletherapist now. Um, and so getting experience in you know, whatever setting, the more the better. So you know, kind of, is this for me? Maybe I didn't like the schools with, you know, TK first graders, but I really enjoyed working with stroke patients in the hospital right? Working in cognitive therapy. Oh, I really, really like that. Or I like working um, with, we call them like AAC devices, like iPads for people who are nonverbal. I really liked working um, in technology there. So really seeing um, what area um, that you may be interested in um, is huge. Um, so a part of my um, schooling for the education major at UCI was to go to um, a school and to do kind of a practicum there. So to learn that way. And I was able to go to one in Irvine and I loved it so much. Um, I kind of took the opportunity um, to go into uh, different, um, what we call special day classes. So those are um, kids with special needs that's different from general education. And I thought, wow, wow, there's incredible things happening here. And I was like, what is that device that they're using? Oh, that's really cool. Um, so that's kind of where I started, I mean, in terms of um, at UCI. And then um, I did more like private practice um, observations and yeah, all that good stuff. And you learn so much about how differently people do things, the different strategies they use, um, kind of their story, how they um, kind of got to where they are. Um, and I always also say, um, really take it upon yourself to, um, to seek out opportunities yourself. I think, you know, if you're just waiting um, for someone to maybe ask you, it may take a longer time to do that. So really kind of being proactive. And when I was at that school in Irvine, I was like, hmm, I'm going to ask the speech therapist if I can shadow them or observe them. I'm not allowed to do anything, but let me see kind of what it's like. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really awesome. And I was able to graduate a little bit early. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay. I'm just going to volunteer, not for anything else than to just gain experience. So kind of taking that upon yourself, I think you can really um, set yourself apart from others if you're really kind of going that extra mile to get that experience, even if it's for no money, even if, you know, there's not this um, kind of title that comes with it. Um, but really, yeah, getting experience and seeking out um, a bunch of different settings. Um, there's, there is also um, an SLP assistant. Um, job as well. Um, and so um, it does require you to go to um, a SLIPA program to pass a SLIPA exam, licensing exam, um, and get a bunch of, of hours. Um, but uh, SLIPAs, what we call them, SLIPAs um, are able to carry out treatment if it's under a licensed SLP, um, but they aren't allowed to um, um, come up with goals. Um, they aren't allowed to do um, kind of assessments, like formal assessments. Um, they're just able to do therapy under, under an SLP. Thank you for, for sharing about that. Actually, Kristen, do if a student went, or if an individual went to like um, a SLIPA program, right? And then they graduated and then they worked as an aide in that area. If they later then wanted to become a speech language pathologist, is it a faster route or would they, I mean, they're then applying to SLP programs and it's like they're starting from ground zero again. Um, is there kind of an advanced or a, a quicker way because they've been a SLPA or, or not? I think so. So um, the SLPA that, that I've been um, in contact with, you know, she's a SLPA, she likes being a SLPA. And when she applies to grad school, which you have to do anyway, um, she has, you know, all the, 
for most of the classes. Um, so that's kind of a big advantage. Um, you're in the classes, you probably have a lot of um, in-person experience if you're already you know, working somewhere where you are um, a SLIPA. Um, you do have to apply to grad school just like everyone else um, and either, you know, yeah, it's, it's pretty tricky, but um, you still have that experience. And so let's say you go into an interview and they ask you, you know, do you have any experience? You can say, yeah, I'm actually a SLIPA. I've been practicing for this many years. Maybe here's some things that I've learned, some strategies. So that you probably definitely have a leg up, but you still need to, yeah, uh, apply for grad school, complete it. And then it's a whole other separate um, SLP like license exam. Yeah. Okay, I, I see. And it, I, I would imagine that for, many of the areas maybe that's somewhat similar it's it gives you great experience hands-on experience exposure to the field and um and working with um patients but if you want to be the ptot audiologist like you're going to need to go to those specific grad programs and and you know maybe there is or maybe there isn't a a shorter route because you've already done that the aid uh, education but um it's, it's good to know. Um, let's see, I think Hannah, if you wouldn't mind speaking to this question. So OT has a lot of cool opportunities to volunteer as well, similar to PT, and that we can do hippotherapy, which is working with horses. Um, I did a bit of that uh, volunteering before with kids with disabilities, and that was just really fun to see them on top of the horse and getting to groom them and everything. I also did a bit of aquatic therapy before I started OT school. Um, so we'd work with kids with cerebral palsy and really getting them moving in the water, which is a lot harder for them if they're on land, trying to manipulate them in certain ways. I think obviously grades are important too for us as well. Um, there is one position, a rehab aid that works alongside PTs and OTs in the hospital that I see a lot of people kind of doing that as prep work and that they can be paid as they're interning and just getting more familiar with the diagnoses and kind of how the disciplines work together. Um, so I think that's a really important aspect of it. But I think the most important thing for OT is really lean into your hobbies. I've gotten to cook with so many different patients and inpatient, and that's really awesome because you can learn about their culture and you can really get them comfortable and trying to pull in their memory at the same time and see how well they can navigate if they're an amputee, not having to do it in a wheelchair. Um, so really like kind of take those parts of yourself that are important to yourself, sports or any kind of avenue in that way, and just really explore it more and bring that into your practice. I love that you can be creative like that. And it, like you said, incorporate your own sort of um, skills or interests outside of what you do for a living to really kind of help you um, in, in your role and or inspire um, the, the clients and the patients that you work with. So um, that's that's really cool. And I mean, and who doesn't love working with horses too? So very unique opportunities um, and in very creative avenues to really kind of pursue therapy. Okay, so um, a question about how your current job, so where you all are now, how how well or does it align with what you were thinking in college, your your college aspirations? And I, I know I think all of you have kind of touched a little bit upon that, um, but if you wanted to um, add to your response or just kind of uh, speak to that, that would be great. Um, and maybe we could start with Lori. I would say it aligns fairly well with what I thought. Um, the only thing that's different is that now that I'm a business owner, that's a completely different piece of it. And as I mentioned before, I've never had a business class and it's, it's tough, but um, it makes it very interesting. I do a lot of creative things. I send out holiday cards every year and I have a friend who's an artist. So I had her one year draw up a Santa Claus and he had a glove finger up. And on the outside, it said, he knows who's been naughty. And on the inside, it said, and he knows who wears their hearing aids every day. So we try to be creative and send something out that, you know, it's kind of a little thank you. Um, so that part, I never thought I'd be doing. But the, the part of, you know, working with people, the interpersonal skills, you know, fitting hearing aids. Well, and actually when I started, hearing aids were all analog where there was a little screwdriver and we had screw setting a little potentiometer and we turned the screwdriver and said, you know, I hope you hear better. Now, of course, they're digital. They're all on computers. But when I started school, 
th this is all new. I never knew I'd be working with a computer in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, the world has evolved. Well, and, and Lori, um, thank you for us also touching upon, you know, your role as not just an audiologist, but as, as a business owner. And I, and I do want to pause just because I did get a question from a student and it was specifically for you, kind of what are the advantages um, of running your own clinic? And, you know, are you taking work home? And actually, I, I think all of you, whether you're a business owner or not, that, that question could apply. Like, you know, how is it in your off hours? Are you able to really disconnect or are you taking work home? And, and what's that like? I'm trying harder. I am trying much harder to shut that off. Um, for the first several years, I worked a lot. I worked very hard. You know, there was a lot of trial and error going. Um, so I've improved in, in my business skills. But I mean, it, I was here, I would say, every two to three weeks. One night, I'd stay till 11 or 1 o'clock in the morning in the office. Um, so I don't do that anymore, but, um, you know, it's, it's a huge responsibility. You know, if the money is not coming in, I have to pay my employee. I stay small. I don't want to grow. I don't want a lot of personalities. I don't want to have to pay a lot of people. So, so I rather keep the money for myself. So, um, you know, then there's more responsibility on me, but, um, I mean, it's a huge responsibility, but it's, it's extremely rewarding in what I'm able to do. I can give somebody free hearing aids if I want, um, somebody who's destitute. I do a lot of home visits, a lot, too many. Um, I have one guy that I go see in a memory care and I have like a little doctor's bag, a little leather doctor's bag and I always bring him um a McDonald's chocolate sundae and he expects it you know he's like oh could you go get me one and I always go I brought it but you know I'm not getting paid to do that but you know you can do these things and and it's it's pretty rewarding I, I love that um and I'm sure he's so thankful for I mean, just the relationship that you've built mm -hmm. um, and, and what a wonderful opportunity for all, you know, all of the careers represented again in this panel to be able to develop um, just a little bit more consistent relationships with your, with your mm -hmm. clients. Thank you. Um, how about you, Kristen? Yeah, I think um, so. Yes, yeah, so I was a psychology and social behavior and then educational studies. And I think like, yeah, it's very similar. Um, I think at the core um, to what um, I wanted to do in college, um, definitely that education piece is super important. Um, maybe, you know, I'm not teaching them math lesson per se, but um, I'm teaching them, you know, how can we use our words um, to communicate? Um, how can we um, kind of read people's social cues um, to learn what to do next or how to respond appropriately? Um, and yeah, I think, um, you know, so at the core, yeah, education is huge, not just for the children, but also for their parents as well. Um, when I was working, in private practice for um, for early intervention, so younger than three, it was a lot of parents being like, "What do I do? Like my kid's not talking. You know, it's it's really hard to know like what they want, um, and it can get really frustrating." Um, so working with parents too, you know, how do we um, stimulate like language learning, um, and you know, even stuttering as well. Like how do we help um, increase their confidence when they're talking? So um, I think the core. Yeah, values are still there and it's kind of kind of cool too because um, in my job in the school you work really closely with the school psychologist um, and so that's like oh okay like I, I kind of know you know a little bit what you're talking about or maybe the terms that are being thrown around um, and so yeah that's really great for me. I love that thank you so much uh, for sharing all those uh interesting parts about your, your job and also again what you've observed in different settings whether it's with the public school district that's I imagine Anaheim's pretty large and um versus private practice and what you've seen there 
Uh, let's see, how about you, Hannah? Um, how have, does your current job align with what you were thinking about when you were in college? I think in undergrad, the core of just wanting to help people go into either a nonprofit or an NGO, um, kind of at a bigger scale and now working directly with individuals. It's definitely the demographic I wanted to target back in undergrad, um, but a completely different role. And I think I'm much happier in that having that direct patient care every day, getting to hear people's stories and them teaching me things. And I just feel it's a very reciprocal uh, relationship, which is cool. I feel like I learn just as much from them as they do from me. And I think it is more fulfilling being more directly involved um, in their lives. I think what's cool from grad school of what I pictured myself for my future career is that I was working in a stroke clinic and to now be on mainly a neural floor. It's just really great to kind of see it all come to fruition. The level of, um, I guess, severity of what you've seen is, you feel like it's it's pretty, it's a pretty wide spectrum. Yeah, yeah, thank you. How about you, Jeremy? Yeah, so um, undergrad, I definitely fell in that category. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, like, I think the statistics, like, almost like one in, I don't know, some crazy number, but uh, I didn't know what I really wanted. I just knew something healthcare. And like I said, I just kind of happened to join the sports medicine internship. And through that, I was like, oh, physical therapy is kind of a cool field. And, you know, let's definitely try to pursue this because I'm, um, I enjoy it and it's fun to do. Um, so, and then actually what I'm doing right now is the furthest from what I thought I was going to be doing when I was in grad school. Um, by now I thought I would be working for some professional sports team. Um, and I'm in a hospital helping people get back to work. So it's similar, I guess, but not, um, quite where I was going to be, but, um, occupational health, although I would say is working in a field where we're dedicated to helping people who are injured on the work site get back to work. It's actually comparatively to other physical therapy fields. I think it's for me a little bit more rewarding because um, with physical therapy, there's I can go on a very long tangent about this, but one of the common issues, and um, maybe Hannah might have experienced this once or twice, is um, a lot of time pain becomes a lot of people's narrative. And then they like live in this world of like pain management. Um, with occupational health, there's at least what we're what we're working toward is a goal, which is to get back to work, um, which is a lot more tangible. I guess it's it's a lot easier to acquire and achieve those goals because people have set goals and they have things that they want to do. Um, versus like when you're in the field where I work in some pain clinics where um it's just managing pain and pain is it it, it can be one of those very difficult things where it can it can become anything at any mo given moment and anything can trigger pain and so it with that is all about kind of learning the psychology of healthcare <laughs> um with occupational health there's still a little bit of that but well, the fun part is just working with a group of people where we are trying to work towards a goal of getting them back to work and then it's always kind of fun to come up with like fun creative ideas to stimulate work activities in the clinic when you don't have the things that they do. So that's always fun. I, I think for kind of going off going off script a little bit for anyone who on the panel who might want to chime in, that like that again, that psychology piece of it, right? So I think when you go through your um your professional programs to to learn how to do what it is you do for a living. Um, I imagine, I would hope that there are some classes or courses you take where they're addressing that, right? Like that, how do you work with someone who might be resistant to receiving the therapy that, that they need to do and, and the exercises that um, will help them improve? Did, did you feel like the majority of what you've learned um, to handle that sort of the psychology side has been on the job? versus through your, um, or, you know, through your colleagues, just best practices um, and, and just trial and error versus how your, um, your grad programs have prepared you. Uh, if anyone 
wants to speak to that. I think that would be kind of interesting because I imagine that's that's tough. You can be probably the most amazing um, expert on the technical side of things, but if you don't know how to perhaps pivot and adapt and adjust and be flexible to be able to work with a variety of clients in a variety of stages, it's not really going to be effective if you can't communicate with them. So um, Hannah, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, we did a lot of role playing in OT school and that we would have a lot of really uncomfortable conversations and people would present as different diagnoses at some times and you would step out of the room as a therapist and then they would role play the patient and they would come at you with a certain situation. And so you have to figure your way out. And then we would be doing it in different groups. And then we would kind of all talk as a class, like, okay, how did this person react? I remember there was this one situation where we had, everybody was acting as a patient. And then all of a sudden at the same time, the teacher kind of coughed or something and they all, and everybody slammed their hand down at the same time. And that was our chance to react as a therapist. Cause that happens at times when people get agitated. And do you give them a break? Do you keep pushing them? How do you react in that situation? We kind of talk through it. So I think that for me to look back on as a clinician has been very helpful. You learn on the job, you learn from your colleagues, but I think everything that Wash U gave me as a foundation was super helpful in those kind of classes, those psych and communication kind of classes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, definitely similar to Hannah, we have some role playing classes as well in my program. But I would say a lot of it, a lot of my development came from in terms of that stuff came from um, in PT school. We're pretty heavy on um, internships during the program, and so the internship she, internship she completed during the program that actually you, there's a lot of kind of like on the job learning, but you're not really working because you're doing an internship. But then. Um, through that, you kind of learn like how to interact with people. You you watch your clinical instructors and they can give you pointers on how to like talk to people. Uh, so that's been most of my development through that, through those um, internships. Thank you. Lori or Kristen, do, do either of you want to comment on that? I'll say that when I was in college, there wasn't a lot of support in that way. However, now that we've changed to the doctoral, the AUD program, I think the programs are a lot stronger. And, um, and I think some master programs, master level programs were stronger than mine was. Um, but now consistently, I think the students are getting a lot more support and a lot more understanding of what they would really be doing um, and learning to make those pivots for sure. Thank you. Go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, I would say um, that, so school, a, a lot of it too is, is studying maybe the theories of different uh, treatments or evaluations. And that's kind of your like foundation, right? kind of that knowledge of the anatomy, um, you know, um, the neuro disorders that you're working with, all that is kind of foundational. And then for us in grad school, and we had to do uh, different clinicals. So we had an in-house clinic. So we had to do, you know, child clinic, um, adult clinic, and a multicultural clinic, which is really awesome. Um, and then our externships um, were, you know, you could do hospital or you could do um, or medical or you could do um, private practice and then the school setting. So that's kind of like those um, clinics that are required uh, for the program. Um, but of course, you can go out and you can observe and you can um, volunteer um, at all these other settings. But in those clinics is really, again, where you learn kind of the role play situation. You have real clients. Um, and at least for our clinic, um, we were in like this, all the rooms had like kind of a one way mirror situation. So you couldn't see out, but your supervisor can see in. So what would actually happen is we would record ourselves uh, for every session and we would review how do we do um, and our supervisor worked very closely with us. Okay, mm, you know, maybe you should have tried this instead. What's another strategy that you could use if their, you know, behaviors is, is going awry. Um, and so that's again where you really learn the in-house clinic, um, when you have those clients, and then when you're working outside, obviously with other professionals um, to see kind of 
more the real world of situations. And still like, you don't, you're, I don't think I don't, I'm going to know everything. And so even coming into um, the workplace being like, you know what, today may, might throw many new things at me that I've never experienced before, but how can I problem solve, use my critical thinking skills, use my knowledge base and, and learn from there. Cause again, you're not going to know every situation and that's okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I think I just have one last question before we um, perhaps take some questions from the chat. And again, if you're in the audience um, and you want to submit a question through the chat, by all means, please feel free to do that. And then um, we'll turn into breakout rooms um, shortly after that. But my last question is just any last minute insights that you want to leave with um, students. Um, and we can start with uh, Kristen. Sure, I would say, number one, I don't think it's ever too late to maybe change careers. I've had a lot of um, friends who maybe started on one path and they said, you know what, I'm not, not really feeling it. And so they might feel like, oh no, but it might be too late, but I really don't think it's too late. And that brings me to my, my next thing is I really encourage, um, and you probably hear this all the time, but encourage you to find something that you're passionate about something where you can wake up and be excited um, to go to work. Maybe not every day, but um, parts of it that make it um, very exciting because I think you having a passion to do anything um, doesn't have to be, you know, in our um, health fields, but something that you're passionate about because I think it really shows in terms of just um, your motivation to go to work every day, but also kind of um, how you handle, handle yourself um, with your clients or your coworkers or things like that it really makes a difference if you actually like your field. Um, and yeah, kind of not doing just maybe the bare minimum, but if you like being creative about it or reaching out or eventually um, being a supervisor and teaching people. Um, I think all those things really are really important um, if you like what you're doing. Perfect, thank you. How about you, Hannah? I think a really key thing for me in applying to OT school would be to don't underestimate yourself. And there's always so much stress and anxiety. Everybody's, oh, it's so hard to get into this. And OT is also moving towards that doctoral path. So I think there's just a lot of fear in applying to grad school, but just continue to pursue what interests you and do as much as you can on the side, those volunteers and just kind of talking to other people of different disciplines and make sure it's something that you really want to seek out um, because it is grad school will take up a lot of your life but really enjoy the process, throw yourself into it. It's gonna be hard, but it's kind of a roller coaster and there'll be highs and lows. And it's nice to have that cohort to go through that. And you'll always have those special people in your life um, that went through that tough period with you and you can carry that onto your career. Hannah, how large was your cohort? Mine was 94. It was 86 women and eight men. Wow. So yeah, OT is pretty skewed towards women. So it would be nice to get more men in the field and just a bit more diversity as well. That adds a whole new component to it. Is, is that pretty common? Not so much the the um, predominantly female, but like the size of the cohort for programs? Yeah, it's typically about 100. It's um, okay. the top programs at the time were Boston, USC, and WashU, and they're all about the same size. Okay. Um, and so that was something that I was coming from the outside was really starting to get anxious and that, you know, I don't think I could go to one of these top schools. And I had a friend at law school at Washi was, like, oh, just apply. So you never know. So you might as well take your shot is my biggest piece of advice. Excellent advice. Um, how about you, Jeremy? Yeah, I uh, actually all agree with Kristen on the never too late to change career things. Um, I didn't I didn't really figure out what I wanted to do until my maybe third, fourth year of college. And at that point, everyone was already like prepping to take the MCATs, the LSAT, um, like already taking those tests. Um, so never too late to change your career or change your career path. Um, and it's really important, again, to kind of harp on the whole like find something you enjoy because um, I've worked in a job before where I woke up every day and want to punch myself in the face. Um, not a really good place to be. So do find something that you do 
like at least I think maybe enjoy and be passionate about is definitely ideal, but the bare minimum is just something that you can tolerate. You should just wake up and like clock in, clock out, and you feel perfectly fine at the time you're done. That's ideal. Um, and then, um, you know, and I just, I, I'm doing something I could say that I enjoy. So it's not like I hate my job. Um, and then on the same note, it's also kind of what Hannah said about like graduate school and just kind of enjoying the process and everything going through it because once, once you're in the program, like it, it is a completely different world and it is kind of the lens into what your life will be afterwards. Maybe not the same like levels of stress and intensity, but it definitely feels it's a very small preview of what life can be. So it's always enjoy getting there and enjoying your experiences. And actually, I will say this to anyone, everyone applying to PT school. One of the most common like essay prompt that I've, I've seen all the time that I helped like students in the past write was they always ask about like explain a life experience when you experience X, Y, Z. So I always say in the process of, you know, applying to any grad school, you're going to be hit with that question. And I say there's no better time to kind of enjoy and experience life than right now in undergrad when you kind of have that freedom. So, and so that way, when you do apply to grad school and you get hit with the explain a time you experience X, Y, Z, you, you have something to say <laughs> and you have a fun story to write about. So. I love that. And then if, if students are volunteering or observing or shadowing or, or working, like, you know, the, the more you're trying things, the more opportunities you're going to have to gather examples of um, what you do and how you respond in different situations and working with different types of people. And I could see that being ripe for asking um, potential applicants to grad programs. Tell me about how you responded. So great advice. How about you, Lori? I'd like to point out, I think um, a common thread be between the four disciplines that we're representing this, this afternoon is that we're very diverse in what we can do and what we can choose to do. We can get bored within our own job and, and change it by not going back to school. There, there are other areas within each of our own fields to go into, which makes it interesting. And I think it's important I think we all want to, you know, expand and use our mind and our brain. And, and I think that's very, very important. So um, we can work part-time. I mean, I worked part-time for several years when my kids were busy with sports and activities. So that was very important to me to have that available to me. But I just think follow your dreams work hard for a few years, you, you will sacrifice. There is sacrifice definitely when you're going to school and you're not able to attend this function or that, but work hard and it pays off. It pays off in a huge way. I love that. I think you are all beautiful examples of that. The hard work, the dedication, the determination, taking extra classes, going above and beyond um, to get you to where you're at. And I think judging by the number of individuals on um, tuning in, again, I think that there is such an interest in pursuing a variety of these careers. So I just wanted to say thank you so much um, to our panelists and the audience um, just for tuning in and learning a little bit more about um, these really interesting career paths. Um, and uh, before we actually, I don't want to sign off yet, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, the next brief portion, which is our breakout rooms. So let me 